and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. In the red corner, we have the one and only Rick Hines. And in the blue corner, we have a scribe called Pat, better known as Pat Edwards. You know, it's like a tribe called Quest. You say the whole thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hello. And hello. Like, How are you two doing was... today? Good. This is Pat, by the way, so people can get our voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Pat. I'm Rick. Uh, yeah. As for how we're doing today, well, you know, for those who are listening, this thing is being recorded really early in the morning, and coffee is still flowing through my veins, which is early. like ninety percent of what animates you, me. So, how dare you call this early in the morning? Uh... <laughs> I have to deal I'm... with juggling like five different time zones, so uh, so I don't have no, an I... early morning or an evening. I just have time as a continuous. I'm just giving Rick a hard time because I'm a time zone ahead of him, and I have three very very young children. So, yes, I'm and a... I yeah. And I'm a professional vampire, and the sun is a deadly laser. So you know, as as far as I'm concerned, it's freaking morning. Yeah. Oh, it's you too, morning. huh? Yes, we're getting compliments. Uh, you said something in your intro about an open bar. Can I? Is that? Can I get a Paloma? Can I get one of those? <laughs> or someone would love I've a never, Paloma. I've never had a Paloma. Oh, they're delightful. Oh. They're incredibly underrated, in my opinion. Uh, it's basically, if you like grapefruit and if you like a margarita, but you're not in the mood for something so sweet, it's like a muted. Because it uses grapefruit juice. I will always like prefer a... tang or tart to outright sweet. Mm -hmm. You um, should try a Paloma then. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to find one, find anyone who makes one in, in Minnesota. But worst comes to worst, I'll just do it myself. There you go. <laughs> but um, I did. I I did end up get. I did end up getting some Irish some Irish whiskey the the other day, but. That, but I'm still waiting for that to actually come in. Mm. Um, I also approve of that. I'm still also just shocked at the fact that I've known Pat all these years, and this is the first I've ever heard him mention a Paloma, and I still have no idea what the hell this is. You don't know what a Paloma is? No, I have. I, I feel like my life has been partly robbed from me now. You know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to go find a Paloma. That's my <laughs> Paloma, <right? laughs> Everyone... Uh, I, I have a, a good friend who is a professional artist and comic book artist, and we talk about all the time about how Palomas are amazing, but we'll forget they exist for like an extended period of time, like six months or plus or something like that. And they're like, oh my God, Palomas exist. Why am I not drinking one right now? And you get them. They're delightful. Yeah. But to put in perspective how, how much I prefer tarts, I am one of those crazy people who who will eat who will eat a whole lemon if if I can get away with it. Nice. I respect uh, that. The only downs the only downside is it's made me a lemonade snob where most lemonades are too sweet. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, and most and most and the only lemon candy I'll really put up with is warheads. You are a glutton <laughs> for punishment. Of course of course I am. One, one being in, being involved with game design, you kind of have to be. <laughs> two. Relatable. Two. I play a lot of Souls likes. Okay, and th and three, I've suffered through Kaizo Mario way too many times. <laughs> oh man! Also, the, that uh, that's a deep cut right there. Yeah. Also, there also there was the t there was the time where I um where I had, I had done stunt work for a lo for a local film, which which is a nice way to say I got pa I get paid a few hundred bucks to get my ass kicked. <laughs> never do a never. If anyone says that that it's just going to be a quick bar fight scene, they're lying. Wow, that's like eight hours of shooting. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, eight hours of shooting, and I ended up having way too many um, wooden t wooden um, bar stools broken off of my back. <laughs> I mean, they gimmicked them so that so that it so that it doesn't hurt as much, but it hurts less. Not. At not, it yeah, it's still a, it's still a thing that is a solid. It's solid enough to stand on its own, and it's it's still striking you at a fast speed. So yeah, I imagine, <laughs> even though it's meant to come apart, I'm sure it's like yeah, it still hurts. Oh, and 
the way my the way my mentor would often put it is is it worse to get crapped on by a pigeon or a blue jay? I like that. Uh, the uh, the answer of course is trick question, you're still getting crapped on. Right. But a tradition I have is to open with the humble beginnings. Um I'd like you guys to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Like, personally, not professionally, necessarily? Yeah, because the professional part we'll lean into, but every journey has a first yeah. step. Rick, why don't you go ahead? Because you got yours is a longer story, I feel like. Oh, sure. Uh, so, let's see. My first introduction to role-playing games was uh, being a kid and finding uh, this uh, copy of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons on a bookshelf at Barnes & Noble. And we can go all the way back there and be like, hey, I read this book and I had nobody to play with and it was high school and there was all this time. And that didn't really make it stick. What really made it stick was, for better or worse, I was on the chess team. And I know this sounds exactly like the meme that it could be, but um, there was this ridiculously cute girl from another school at a chess meet who had a copy of a book called Wraith the Oblivion. And the I ended up getting the book. We ended up talking, becoming friends, uh, you know, and starting to hang out more. And this led to us actually playing my first uh, RPG game, which was me storytelling, because I've had a curse in my life where I've always been the forever GM uh, for two players by candlelight, a Wraith the Oblivion game um, about every two weeks, um, sort of in the upper attic of whatever high school that we were found in, um, you know, during these uh, chess meets all throughout the state of Illinois. So for about a year, we played this really tragic Wraith game um, and did our best to keep the atmosphere and the mood alive. And it was spooky and it was awesome and it was meaningful. And that game brought a lot of tears. After that, I played a lot of Vampire the Masquerade, Mage the Ascension, um, Changeling. You know, I was definitely in the White Wolf Shadowrun vein. And that copy of Dungeons and Dragons that I had picked up never got touched for probably another 10 years until. You know, we were in our 20s at a house and um, we were storing our game books old in, in, in White Castle uh, boxes. But by that point, I had already become a game writer. So my true like introduction into gaming was Wraith the Oblivion, which I know not a lot of people know about or hear about. But it's this game where you already start off dead and you play this uh tragic character trying to resolve lost ends in life while everybody else at the table is playing a shadow trying to bring you down into oblivion mm -hmm. and also my my sympathies for for playing for trying to play a balanced game of mage the ascension because there is no such thing <laughs> oh yeah no mage the ascension is probably the first game system i ever played that uh taught me very early on as a storyteller, the rules are basically meaningless in all game systems. What you're really doing as a storyteller is playing a tension meter with your party at the tables. Uh, welcome to role-playing, where, where all the rules are made up and the dice rolls don't matter. <laughs> um, I mean, if you really think about it, GM screens are uh, there for storytellers to fudge their dice so that we can keep you alive. Because huh. the truth is, players usually die way more than they're aware of, and it's oh, a yeah. lot of it's a lot of work to have everybody rebuild a new character. It's just much easier to say that they skated away with only losing an arm. Uh, although I've always said that the dice are a a model of equality that we can all follow, because it does not matter your your race, orientation, occupation, height, weight, whatever. The dice gods hate you. <laughs> they are angry, vengeful, and cruel. Mm -hmm. the, the, <laughs> they the care dice, not. <laughs> the dice giveth and the dice taketh. Mostly yeah. taketh. Uh, although a good way to get their attention is to is to have is to have some sort of arrogance regarding your luck. Mm -hmm. Something I tend to, I tend to warn people away from, but they don't listen until it's too late. I would like to point out that I was about to make a comment that I've actually always been very lucky with my dice. You, oh, <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. It's out there. Oh, yeah. It. 
no, no, it's uh, it's a whole it's a whole thing. There's a whole story about a D&D for kids game that I ran where these kids were convinced that my table or that I had sold my soul to somebody I shouldn't have. Because every single time I rolled the dice out, outside of the GM screen, it was just naturally critting. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> I think I sold my soul. It's just, it's just weights, kids. They're just weighted. That's all. <laughs> I, in that kind of situation, I probably would have said, "Jokes on you, I'm ginger." <laughs> but the, I will admit, I will admit that the. Ch- the chess club part is definitely right, definitely right in there with the st- with the stereotype. But well, I I uh, went uh, you know in high school I was that guy I was on the football team I was doing all of the things and I walked past drama club one day and I realized that there was a crap ton of uh, people on for there's there was nobody for tryouts uh, there's no guys for tryouts and there was a complete line of of ladies and i was like i am in the wrong sport and then i ended up becoming a freaking techie and doing lighting and stagecraft and i freaking fell in love with it and everybody that was on the tech crew also happened to play chess and so i ended up playing chess team quit football and then i fell in and finally found my uh my people then again i was always a nerd i was playing role-playing games of the video game variety you know old school rpgs since you know i was five years old so yeah, and to be fair, to be fair, I'm not one to talk. Given that, given that I that my my clubs in, in that sense around that time were fencing and hockey. Oh man, I had fencing cool. and uh, hockey to both of them. That's awesome. Uh, even after all these years, I still don't like Italian grips. Okay, fucking, okay. fucking weirdos. <laughs> So what about you, Pat? Where'd you get started at? Yeah, so as I was, I was going to say, uh, I was coming, I came at it from a little bit of a different angle. I I probably always, ha- I always had one foot in the jock and nerd worlds, but maybe a little more heavily in the, in the jock growing up, just because that was, I don't know, what I was kind of funneled into, right? Um, all through grade school, played a sport, you know, every season, fall, winter, spring. Oh, hey. Um, for perspective, just so anybody who's listening, because yeah. they can't actually see it, Pat and I are both um, very, very tall people. But Pat looks like he could crush men's skulls, um, <laughs> you know, with his arms. All right, he is huge in this. <laughs> like, I am like a tank. <laughs> um, I thank you, Rick. Yeah, I, I'll the money, the Venmo is on its way. <laughs> it's very refreshing to not to not be the one tall guy in. In a in a call that I have because I'm I'm six six. Oh, you you got both of us by quite a few, <laughs> a couple of inches. We're we're like the six three club. Um, yeah, but most of most of the time I have people on. They're a bunch of five footers. <laughs> uh, so so I you know pretty typical you know played sports growing up, but I also liked you know I also liked things that would be called nerdy. Like I was very into all of the maybe the more mainstream stuff, right? Like, you know, obsessed with, remember the nineties, uh, X-Men show and then a Spider-Man show and then collected comic books and X-Men Wolverine, Spider-Man spawn. When that first started coming out, I remember yeah. like, cause that was so, I mean, that was the most like risque thing I could get my hands on at that age, oh, in, in okay. like, middle school, junior high age. And anybody who, who, who knows or listens to this is instantly going to have that theme song from the X-Men just now playing. Oh, head. yeah. It doesn't exactly hurt that Power Glove did a very, very good cover of it. Right. Uh, so I was all and then, you know, of course, playing video games and things growing up. Right. Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, all of that. And played and, you know, stuck with sports. I did end up playing football through college as a linebacker and then coached for a while and, um, I also was a, an overweight kid, so I was a lineman and with linebacker. So like, I still like weightlifting was like my de stressor and my like confidence booster. Still do it to this day. But anyway, gaming though. So I came into like specifically RPG gaming, like TTRPGs. I definitely came into it later than most people who have made a career of it or, or made their their you know a huge part of their lives now. And it's something that I, I was aware of for a very long time as a kid. I just never had an opportunity to play. I just wasn't in, in the right circles of people. and uh, Or I felt like I couldn't necessarily be 
myself or bring it up or if, you know so it was something that i never i didn't play like any kind of ttrpg for the first time I actually play it till i was in my 20s mid 20s like mid to late 20s i want to say um so definitely but it was something where it was instant it was just instant like oh this this is my thing this is this is life mm-hmm. where have you been <laughs> it was like this this is i i was just this is the real me <laughs> pretending pretending in these in these games is the real me the the other real me was the real pretending i was doing mm-hmm. and i'm i was going to ask if you if you guys were one, were one system lifers but it sounds like at least with rick that wasn't the case oh yeah no i've i i have played everything or story i've i've either written or story told or played um play is very very small but mostly like ran in everything from shadow run riffs deadlands battle tech uh gurps big eyes small mouth um significant any white wolf system from first edition through there even if you're counting like you know aeon and some of the other uh systems and chronicles of mars um you know and then i've dabbled with some of the indie stuff like dread 10 candles uh fiasco um you know the the truth is legend of the five rings we play we had a, a long running 10 year long campaign um at one point so you know a single system is not where i have lived in the slightest in fact out of all of the things that all the systems that i've played uh dungeon and dragons in its capacity is actually still on the smallest amount of time spent doing even though i've spent probably the most time writing in that sandbox yeah and i um it, i'm kind of the other it's almost i mean very it's 95 percent dnd for me and it's been more like i've been doing you know most of the time and it's just you know haven't really had an opportunity and, and the other games the other systems i've played it's often it's been for an event right like a a stream or a charity and kind of get create a character here's some you know here's a cheat sheet on this system for this one shot here you go you know but as far as extended campaigns or anything it's pretty much been exclusively dd not that i'm not open to it's just that's that's the opportunities that i've i've come across yeah um rick i do i do have to ask i do have to ask the um the fortunate or unfortunate question if you've if you've played traveler how many times that how many times have you died in character creation um let's see i've watched my players uh do an entire session where we were trying to make characters and i think we had one poor unlucky sap at my table who died six separate times um and nobody else did and so we kind of just watched in horror as like every time those dice rolls were hitting those heritage charts and things like that just like oh Sean, you are really unlucky. So we actually took, I did a whole thing with his uh, character and his storyline about, you know, how many past lives <laughs> by the time that we just pushed him through so we could play. Uh, Legend of the Five Rings actually has a very similar mechanic. You can actually die in L5R on your heritage tables rolls as well. Yeah, they they dialed that they dialed that back over over the years, um, which which might which might be for the best. Um, and <laughs> what, 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 uh, my, fa- my biggest memory with L5R, which happens to be one of my favorite RPGs, is the fact that I would have, that I would have to, t- people would have to learn the hard way that they can't, that they can't just go around, uh, go around picking fights. Oh, right. Yeah. No, that's, uh, the, this is, um. This is one thing I like about other game systems, I think, more than, you know, sort of a lot of people's introduction to Dungeons and Dragons, because, you know, back in the day, D&D was designed as more of a dungeon crawl and, you know, less worlds with consequence. Whereas, you know, Vampire the Masquerade and Legend of the Five Rings and Shadowrun were sort of early on game systems that really started bringing that consequence to the table for players' actions um, and true social ramifications um, as a baked-in game system setting. 
like, you know, sure, everybody could run a, a game in their house table and do exactly what they need to do and, and run it however they wished. But as with a campaign meta, I think that other game systems actually helped influence uh, D&D in its later editions. Mm-hmm. Oh. Much to, much to the chagrin of, cer- of certain traditionalists who have the, who um, who are are the people who yell at me over the mere crime of re- of referencing video of referencing video games, despite the two having a closer relationship than people think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I've I've certainly run that game as well. I've run the D and D on hard mode campaign. That was a lot of blast, and that was just a hardcore number crunch. Uh, let's go bring your power gaming, bring your, you know, bring your best character. Let's do the tomb of elemental evil uh, or the temple of elemental evil. And let's, let's go, let's see how far down we can get. Right. You know, and that's, that, that was a, a, a fun five game session run before all the players had finally died. But, you know, um, you can play, Everybody can play the game exactly how they want to play it, and I'm so glad that that is finally the mantra that's out there and how it should be looked at. Mm-hmm. That's what makes it better than a video game. Video games, you only have, you know, the one medium that you're presented to play it. RPGs, you can spin that tabletop RPGs. You can spin that camera angle and tell whatever story you want and whatever method you need to. Yeah. Now. I will, I will, I will admit that some, that some of the, I think, I think for you and I both, some of some of the games that we've dipped into are ones that we'd rather not revisit. I've jo- I've joked for years that I'm not running Phoenix Command again unless I'm paid for hazard pay. <laughs> I never uh, dabbled with Phoenix Command. I do know it, but I do have, um, you know, my system that. I kind of loved, but I also hate, and I'll never go back to it, is actually still to this day Riffs. Riffs join, Matt, join the club. Riffs has been my whipping boy for 20 for twenty or, plus years. Yeah, Riffs math is just a special kind of fun, and I'm like, you know what? Ah, no. <laughs> just not, not, not coming back to it. Oh. <sighs> That whole that whole sto- that whole st- that whole story that um that that was told that was told regard regarding the jeez why can I not remember why can I not remember his name right now um but he he was he was the guy behind Palladium Fantasy and had a significant f- and had that tell had that long post on RPG Net back in two thousand five on his ex- on his experience um. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That's oh Jesus Christ. That's over 17 years ago. All right. That's <laughs> that's that's rebooting up my memory of like oh yeah, I remember hearing about that. Because yeah, there was that, and there was there there was the time where he managed to, where um Sam Beta managed to piss off the entire the entire um Robotech and Macross community. I'm not familiar with that one, but. That oh. one I'll take your word on. <laughs> short ver- short version. He made some he made some really dumb decisions with Robotech Tactics, um, which got which got which got the second wave of that minis game canceled, and he tried and he tried to pin the blame on the manufacturer of the minis. Ah. And, be and and because and I wasn't surprised when after that um. He lo- he lost the license for um, Robotech, and then we ended up getting the Savage Worlds version and the version by Strange Machine, both of which are better, and the Savage Worlds version of Rifts, which is actually a natural fit. Yeah, actually, I happen to really like the Savage Worlds system, and uh, you know Shane over at uh, Pinnacle, I thought he did a great job with Savage Worlds. Mm-hmm. And I. I've enjoyed Savage Worlds as well. It's it's just that I feel that Savage Worlds and Rifts is a natural fit. Cause oh yeah, Savage Worlds is is very much designed for pulpy kind of adventures. 
And it's, you know, built to be modular from the ground up. So when you have a game system setting like Rifts, which is all about, you know, weird, different, you know, periods and timelines clashing together in this apocalyptic setting, it makes it really easy. Mm -hmm. But with that, in, with that in mind, that um, what can you guys tell me about your about your your early transition from playing games to writing about them? All right, Pat. Since I went first last time, you go first here. <laughs> I mean, to, to writing. I mean, so you know, Rick has been obviously been playing them forever, and and has written about written about them for you know different publications out there like geek and sundry and, and nerdist and i you know was getting into playing and at the same time i was also getting heavily into uh podcasting and also both i don't know if we said it both rick and i are also novelists that's how we got our, our professional writing start too we both have a couple of novels each out in the world and more in the works so and then for me, another love I've I've developed over the last ten years is, is podcasting and streaming, and mostly podcasting. But you get into that world, and honestly, real play podcasts. Some of the original, oldest ones are what got me into podcasting. I was doing a lot of driving at the time, and it was one of those things that really made me like, I, I need I, this is my thing. I love this, the podcasting, the playing the games, all of that. So then I, w I went looking for campaigns I could join. I've had a couple of real play shows kind of come and go. I've got one that's running currently on the geekly Inc. That's in its third year. That's a lot of fun. Uh, then the geekly Inc. network. So, you know, and, and you, and you write for those, right? Like if you're, if you're GMing, you're writing the storyline, but as far as writing professionally, but it was just something I was always thought about doing. And it just was very fortuitous that, you know, and Rick and I, we're staying in touch. We're both, uh, we're, we're people, we're guys whose, whose writing careers have been, you know, tied together and, and, and mirrored each other a lot. You know, both our first novels were published on the same, um, by the same publisher. And that's how we met and we really hit it off. And then, so we just stayed in touch. And then as far as, uh, <laughs> I know the red opera is a, is a pretty ambitious and large project, for me to say that's that's technically the first professional you know product for sale rpg writing i've done and but it wasn't always the intent you know and we were talking and rick said hey i got a thing i want to talk to you about and it's it might be just this little splat book you know have you ever thought do you want to do some writing for 5e for rpg and i said heck yeah that sounds like a lot of fun as a little side thing to do a fun project and let's just see you know a fun challenge i love challenges when it comes to writing I'm someone who thrives on who thrives on the challenge of writing. If you give me an assignment and it's I need you to write this, it's gotta be this long, but not this short, you know, between these word counts and it has to accomplish X, Y, and Z, but you have to avoid A, B, and C also. I don't know, that really gets me going and I enjoy that, whereas a lot of people just want a blank page. Uh so the thought of trying to write for a gaming system was just incredibly immediately very interesting to me. And that is how we started. It was going to be this tiny little 2,000 word splat book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as for me, um, just like Pat had mentioned, yeah, we're both novelists. We both published by the same company. Um, I had been working, though, for Geek and Sundry. I actually had did some freelance uh, writing, you know, back in the day uh, for, you know, just several other game lines. Nothing major. It was like, hey, submit your, you know, thousand word you know little submission here or you know make your three thousand word little chapter bit here for this game book or game company and um so i kind of dabbled with that but primarily uh it was really working for geek and sundry i did all of the gm tips um after matt mercer was done with his series and i was writing the gm tips with um you know for like two years um, of blog posts. And my other beat was covering other people's Kickstarters, other game companies. So it gave me a lot of exposure into the various game companies and, you know, what was coming out on the market. And that's actually how I got a lot of my, you know, sort of like, oh, hey, Rick, would you like to write on this project? Mm -hmm. And so I did some stuff like that. Um, and I had done the freelancing bit for a while, but because once you're a novelist and you actually have your published books out there, you're like, hey, I could probably do this bigger on my own and be the whole designer. 
And even for myself, the Red Opera, Last Days of the Warlock, is the first major, like, fully designed world sandbox um, that was like, all right, this is a thing that we're we're going to tackle. And, um, you know, that whole thing was was born in my kitchen, which I guess we'll probably talk about it at some point or even now. Um, you know, it was me and the metal band sitting in my kitchen drinking mead and they were talking about how hard it is to get metal music out in the world. And I was like, guys, you have an entire orchestral soundtrack, right? Like I could storytell to this music. Why don't you just let me write a campaign for it? And at first I thought I was going to be putting together um, like this little tiny splat book. Um, and that's about when I called Pat up on the phone and I'm sitting there in my house at about like seven o'clock and I'm staring at a manuscript that was supposed to be 20,000 words, but it's realistically going to be 172,000 words. And I was like, yeah, I need a hand, <laughs> you know, cause I had a lot of other stuff going on. And so Pat and I, you know, dived in and we spent, I think Pat, what was it? We spent about a good nine months just dedicated to, drafting the red opera before like anybody else knew about the project you know our editor courtney penny she was around like helping poke in ideas on occasion and um we had another novelist friend uh joseph asfahani who was like helping us with um you know just being our our person who would, he's, a, he's a professional english teacher he would come you know yell at us whenever our plots deviated a bit too far but we spent eight nine months just you know, heads to the keyboard, diving down word count and listening to metal music while we created this entire world. Yeah. yeah. So now speaking, speaking of that, one, one quest, one question that I, that I had, a I had asked the, I'd asked the first time around that I, that I'd covered the red opera is of all of all classes to focus on, why warlock? Ah, yes. The reason I did warlocks. Um, this one was definitely a me thing, and I I am so happy I made this choice. And good question, is because I went through and I have been watching and covering so many Kickstarters, so many other game companies, so many different groups out there, and I've always known warlock was a very popular class, but there wasn't a lot of published content. Um, regarding fully developed warlocks and specifically that relationship with patrons right it was always kind of like yeah you did this thing they were almost like an after a thought afterthought for an edition of dungeons and dragons that just kind of got carried through there was some love there but they were never really fleshed out with that you know you've cut a deal with somebody right and that's a prime role-playing opportunity but then again uh, a lot of those, a lot of the campaign books coming out, uh, or a lot of the the setting books, most people when they write fifth edition content, um, even Wizards of the Coast, um, they have campaigns, but most people write setting books. And I, one thing I noticed right away when I even pitched the idea and I I, I talked to this band about it, I remember telling them it was like everybody writes setting books, so few people write storylines and campaigns, and warlocks provide such a natural opportunity to let your storyteller play almost a vampire, the masquerade or a, you know, legend of the five ring. Again, we talked about it earlier. I had so much background in all of these other game systems that had social ramifications. And I wanted to bring that style of play into Dungeons and Dragons. And so by allowing every single player at the table, whether they're a barbarian, a cleric, a druid, whatever, to interact with a patron and cut a deal, with somebody that they could conceivably take outside of a back alley and beat up later on, um, is an element of gameplay and storytelling that is very near and dear to my heart um, that I wanted to bring into tabletop or fifth edition D and D styles. Mm -hmm. um, Curse of Strahd was probably the closest uh, that Wizards has ever come out with with a published content that I very much enjoyed and. Warlocks also fit naturally the band Dia Mortes. Um, 
saga of the Red Opera. The idea that, you know, Lacroix, the Night Captain, and Dorian, the Accursed King, uh, that these two characters would fall, you know, so so horribly into this war of annihilation because they were making deals with outside forces. Mm -hmm. And so that even the very setting itself and the musical inspiration tied itself very naturally to Warlocks. And speaking of that, how did you end up meeting the band? Um, well, I'm an electrician by day in Chicago. And so I do a lot of concert lighting and night lighting. Um, and the band member... Uh, Drake Mephesta. Um, he's the sort of the, he the face and the head of Dia Morte. Um, and they're an ensemble cast, right? They have everyone from the Black Crown Initiate to Cradle of Filth. You know, it's it's all these different, uh, you know, band members from across the world, actually, because they're an international band. I, this is going to sound entirely nerdy. Drake and I have played Vampire the Masquerade LARPs because I sucked him into one of my games once to come play a special guest um, at a uh, venue I was hosting at. We were putting on a 10-week special run, full costume, rented out location, open bar, you know, kind of full immersive gaming um, for a vampire game that I was running. Uh, that was actually kind of tangentially tied to, you know, my own, own novel worlds and Drake and the band would show up and they would play their, the characters that were cast on them completely over the top and they're like full stage costumes and things like that. And they were playing assigned NPCs for me. And it was at the end of that 10 week run immersive game session. And we had like 150 players for it. And it was great. It was, it was honestly one of the coolest gaming things that I've ever ran in my entire life. But it was at the end of that that we were celebrating and drinking in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And the and and um, that's not as nerdy as you th as you think. It's actually par for the course. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair. Uh, but I might be a bit biased because there's not there's not a there's not a story that I haven't heard that could that could be considered too nerdy. I've I don't want to be the I've seen it all kind of kind of person, but I but I kind of have. Oh, and hey, man! It's a special love out to my heart to those of us who have at one point worn trench coats and played rock paper scissors on river walks in public and had a bunch of regular people looking at us like, "What the heck are these guys doing?" And I'm like, "I'm killing a werewolf. Leave me alone." What the hell? What the hell are you supposed to do in the at, at in um in Saint Paul in the middle of night? You know that's fair. You know, funny enough, you're in Minnesota, St. Paul, or you're 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 right there, huh? Yeah. My um my first novel is actually set in Chicago and Minnesota, St. Paul, and I had to drive up there to go run some vampire games up there, which is where I got some ideas for my settings. Um, I hope I hope you didn't get weirded out if anyone offered you hot dish. Uh, no, actually. What is hot dish? Please enlighten me. It's what Minnesotans call ca what call casserole. But if you're ah. in Minnesota, you have to call it hot dish. That's the rules. Ah. Got it. I had a tour guide, so that was explained to me exactly like you just did it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's where I had met the band and why I picked Warlocks is I really wanted to bring... Um, I knew that it allows you to do a tie between your players and the storyteller for characters. And it's a way to bring... One of the problems I had with campaigns and setting books is they override people's homebrew campaigns. And I always found that problematic because the reason I never really buy campaign books as a forever GM is because I'm always in the middle of my story. And I can't really do anything with a new campaign book or a new setting book that comes out without starting a whole new game. And so by having the Red Opera written in such a way that you could drop it into anybody's world, patrons and warlocks allowed you to take any existing cast of class race combination um you know whatever species people are playing it it doesn't matter all of them will get a chance to experience what it's like to be a warlock and pat had wrote this great adventure called killing time where it doesn't matter you start off the adventure already having like your your character class like stolen by a patron as an introduction into the red opera. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea provided a fantastic hook for it. Um, 
So that's 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 why warlocks and and how I met the band, I guess. Mm -hmm. And you do raise an interesting point when it comes to the relationship between warlock and patron and how it's treated. Because yeah, it is it is window dressing, which honestly it shouldn't be, since the whole point the whole point of being a warlock is making a, for lack of a better term, deal with the devil. Well, the I understand. Okay, so there's um there's a, there's a, a larger game design conversation that can be had around that. Mm -hmm. uh, the first being that. When you have a party of multiple characters, um, it's like uh, hacking systems in other games. Hacking in Shadowrun is terrible because you have the one hacker that disappears from the table. And now you as a storyteller have to take and stop everybody else at the table and go deal with that like digital web. Um, you know, I like sort to of call that the duet problem. Right. Um, you know, you, you have to isolate that one player and go run that scene. Whatever... Uh, you know, in most typical 5th edition games, um, your Warlock player, or even clerics with their gods, those are usually one-on-one -on -one storyteller to player conversations, which unfortunately leaves the rest of the table sort of left sitting there kind of going, well, hey, I'm going to step out. Let me know when it's, when it's our turn for the rest of the game to progress. Mm -hmm. And so I understand why some of it is window dressing, but it could be so much more. And so the solution to that is you open it up to everybody when that patron is there talking to the party or just talking to the one warlock in the group is actually involved with the rest of the party and you know that is easier to do with warlock patrons i think than it is with deities mm -hmm. and it, it's funny story on that front um oh. A dear friend of mine has been working on a 5e hack called Heavens and Heresies, and instead of having Warlock and Cleric as separate classes, he just combined the two into um, Vessel. Gotcha. Yeah, nice. I, I, we go into great length about what separates a patron versus a deity. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. um, and that was actually one of, like, I think my favorite parts of writing in the Red Opera um, for, like, the cool concept that I got to explore like after the Kickstarter, which was like, oh crap, what makes a patron a patron? And what makes a deity a deity? Mm -hmm. And it is, the line is, the line is depend, depending on how you want to interpret it, pretty, th pretty thin. Um, at worst, it's a, as thin as fishing wire, which is pretty damn thin. But well, I mean, I don't know if you've ever ever read it, and for people who are listening, uh, I guess, and people who catch it out, the path that, you know, Pat and I, we spitballed this one back and forth. We asked a bunch of other people. We 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 did a lot of research on this one, and what it came down to was there was this old book called Deities and Demigods um, from Dungeons and Dragons 3.0 that really dived heavily into what a deity is. And so by like referencing that book, we were able to sort of find the negative space of what isn't a deity. And it comes down to, for us in the Red Opera, a patron is somebody who is giving their own personal power to their subjects right the people they make a deal they're warlocks it's actually coming from that thing which means even a small fey in you know like a satyr in the woods even if they're you know not high powered entity can still grant somebody a boon or a blessing or a pact um but that's coming out of their their own pocket they only have so much to go with whereas a deity they have a seat of divinity they have uh, a domain as it will and they're actually handing out the domain's power not their own mm -hmm. and so this the, the reason the reason that's important is the uh warlocks uh, the patrons are more invested in getting and following up with their patrons right because that's their own personal power they've got skin in the game mm-hmm now, I'm guessing in I'm guessing in the early days of prototyping the Red Opera, you ha there were probably some questions about how about how the how the story would accommodate characters who aren't 
warlocks entirely from the ground up um that was the uh, that was the entire design goal that i had um which was how do you bring a game and drop it into anybody's world this was all the years of the geek and sundry kickstarter coverage that i had done i've seen so many things so many game systems out there and like i said when you buy these game books sometimes the only way to really start them is to um restart a brand new game and you don't it's unrealistic to expect that every table that you would sit down to play at has a table filled with five warlocks and so it's like okay how do you tell a story where you can come from any species background class you could be high tier you could be low tier you could be in this world the only requirements that i was able to uh parse it down this was partly uh pat's genius vision with the setting surrounding the city of yonkath like pat is the mastermind behind a lot of the setting um uh, sandbox and the expanded reaches of the shade lands but it was all designed that we could drop it into anybody's world and designed so that any group of players could experience this campaign like that was you know how you, you hear those stories of people that have like design principles up on a wall like like the three rules are it was like metal anybody could play it it is always a tragedy are the three design roles. Mm -hmm. And when, that bring, that brings me to the, I want to talk a bit more on the concept of tragedy because it's one of those, it's one of those things that when you think about the um, power fantasy in a lot of role-playing games, the idea of doing a tragedy or a, tra or a tragedy in story um, would seem would seem counterproductive in in some views. How would how would you handle that? Well, um, I mean, it is the Red Opera, and mm -hmm. operas are always tragic tales. And no matter what the players do, there's multiple choice endings. And even if they read the book, <laughs> they'll never be able to figure out which way it's going to go. And uh, yeah, you got something, Pat? Because I was like, don't. This is not a book for you if you want everything to be super hunky dory in the end. You you're you're making you're make you're you're gonna have a choice. You you got a you got a choice to make at the end. Um <laughs> and uh that was I will give credit to Rick. That was something we worked really hard on is we wanted um we wanted a campaign that was replayable. We wanted a campaign where the ending wasn't a for you know and expected we're gonna save the day it, it, it's there are i'm sure there's other endings that could people couldn't are going to stumble into even that we didn't even like explicitly write but we've got kind of four potential endings based on the choices the players make and to varying degrees of uh pain and suffering <laughs> that they'll experience in each one but it's kind of a choose your punishment type thing and you know the reason why is every every villain every hero's story they always have consequences to their actions whether they're positive or negative but the sandbox that they play in will always be impacted you can't have one side win without the other side suffering and that's just the way that the cookie crumbles i guess in this um you know so if the players have convictions then they're going to be really happy with their outcome but um that's only over the ashes of their enemies let's just say yeah and it's and and there's two you know this doesn't spoil it but there's two opposing forces and factions i think rick and i also both enjoy exploring like gray morality in writings and kind of uh you know the line between how far is too far in the service of what you consider good and this isn't a clear put this way the it's going to be and again a lot of this is going to go on to the the gm the storyteller of everyone who's playing this campaign at home right because some are going to take this 
at a very face value like oh this is the villain and it's not explicit though we didn't write it explicitly like this is the villain and this is the hero it's very like this person could end up being the big bad or this person could end up being the big this character could end up being there's there's three four different potential npcs that could based on the way that the the gm chooses to present things or play things or role play things and then based on the choices the players make uh, you're gonna have some players. You're gonna have some parties who are like, "Oh yeah, we we allied with this group and it was great. We stopped the evil so and so." And then you're, they're gonna have other players like, "What are you talking about? The, those people you allied with are the evil ones." Like, what? No, they're <laughs> and it's it's uh, like, no, this one's just a misunderstood. And we tried really hard to have a lot of um, just kind of fluidity in that regard in the sense of it's not black and white. Like here's good. Here, here's the heroes and here's the villains. Go get them gang. Uh, mm-hmm. We wanted it to be something there. It, I feel like I'm honestly, I'm just really proud of it. Cause it, it feels like something where you can have uh 10 different at home part player, you know, player groups play through this and they'll have 10 very different experiences. Yeah. And I'm getting, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that one of the design goals you had early on was not making an all roads lead to Rome kind of approach. Oh, absolutely not. I hate narrative sandboxes where you have your narrative railroads. Uh, um that is that is that is my I guess if I wanted all roads to lead to Rome and have the same ending and have that like approach, I would have just wrote a novel. There are no trains in the Shadelands. Right. I will note I will note that there is a analogy that a that my mentor had had said on the on the matter, which I don't mean offense I don't mean offense to either of you when I say this, but a novelist is shorthand for a bad DM. Oh no, uh, not in the slightest. Uh, uh, no. there's, there's a there's a joke we didn't even make ourselves. It was like, hey, wait a minute. Um, you know, as novelists, we get to be a little bit insane. I have a cast of characters that are all running through my plot line and storyline, following my outline. And you know, really, I already know what's going to happen. I know how that end's going to go there. And I think that as an author, I am god of my own world, and I can tell my characters to do whatever they want. Until we realize that even in our own brains that doesn't work and our characters are going to end up deviating from our own outlines. And like, I can be like, dude, X character. I can't say which character. I had a character die in the middle of writing one of my books. And I was like, you bastard. You're not supposed to be dead ever. I'm still mad at that character. He, that character lives in my own brain. I might like, like, <laughs> you know, that's just how it works. Yeah. Um, no, I don't take offense to like novelists. I've said that, or it's like an insult against because it's all context, right? Like I, I've listened to different shows. There's so many, you know, real play shows, and it was obvious the GM real had a real specific uh, idea of what they wanted everything to go. It's almost like the players were just along for the ride. And in my head, I was thinking, bro, you should just go write a novel, a fantasy novel, because this isn't this isn't gaming. You're not giving your players a role playing adventure. You know, they're two very different skill sets. Mm-hmm. So no, I don't take offense to that, but yeah, it's the two very, very different animals writing a, a book, a novel, or a, a role playing game. Yeah, and I'd say the I'd say the when it comes when it comes to that, of course on on the other end of on the other end of things, there you can make. You can make the branches in a narrative too complex. You could have the you could end up having the tumbleweed that was all the dialogue options in just one part of something like Alpha Protocol, for instance. Um, how do you make how, what sort of um, restraints no. did you guys have in place to make sure you didn't go too far the other way? Oh, in in gaming, I was like, no one has ever accused my novels of being too complex. <laughs> that's that's only funny if you know that I I write about aliens who get drunk and have foul mouths <laughs> that's about it <laughs> getting the shenanigans yeah i'm more it's more about the fact that because of the fact that there's br- that there's branching um, branching tears you have tiers. to you have to at some point stop pretending that the people who are storytellers don't know what they're doing mm-hmm. and you have to at some point realize that every home group is going to run their game the way that they are going to want to run their game and find their own tales and their stories um 
that is meaningful and impactful to that group of players. So what we do is we provide, you know, the plot beats. We have the main campaign largely written out. And then even at the end of every chapter, we have these like three little things that we put in, which is like, you know, potential side quest ideas and things like that and branching tales that are not as fleshed out you know they're just like a paragraph of like hey you could run your group down this path if you wanted to here's where that would might lead as a suggestion but you do have to lean and understand because i mean the book is already huge right it's you know like over 174,000 words it's two curse of strads put together um you you do have to lean and trust the storyteller right and the players to be like, hey, you're going to craft the story. Like, here's the sandbox. Here's this tale. Here's these possible endings. Here's this timeline of events that's going to unfold around your players. You're the storyteller. How you still weave that tale to your players is ultimately up to your tale. And we we do this explicit with a few tools. We have uh, like this letter letter home mechanic, which you know the the characters like write this like hand write this letter in the game, um, and they hand it to their storyteller to like a loved one, which totally isn't going to be used for something evil later. Um, <laughs> you know, like we have these tools to tie the players into the story and I, I i will go back to mentioning pat's adventure killing time um because even the intro for killing time grounds those players into the setting um sort of like like tossing them in a pool of water and but they're once they're in they're they're hooked that these events are going to unfold and they can leave they can decide that they're not going to play along with any of the events and they're going to go explore some other aspect of the shade lands, which is totally cool. One of the endings actually plans for that. Um, you know, there's, you, you have to trust the storyteller, right? And I, as tedious as some campaign books are where they will come out and they'll say, this event is going to happen. Then this event is going to happen. And here's this stat block. And here are the only solutions that could possibly happen or th on the flip side where they tell you absolutely nothing and they just say here is this beautiful setting craft your own world and story with zero guidance we're kind of somewhere in the in the middle we've given you a timeline of events and we've given you a setting and you will have to weave as a storyteller what is impactful to your players at your table yeah, and, and it it helps mm -hmm. when you have music and tactile sensations and other ways to give this full music this, this full immersive experience but you have to trust the storyteller and i think that's important i think somewhere down game design i i'd like to see more of that trusting the storytellers mm-hmm and there, de there definitely has been a wave of very player centric design, very player centric design, which is under understandable. But that's only one. That's only one half of the equation. At the end of the day. Oh yeah, and player centric design, you know, is arguably, you know, one could make a giant case for driven more by the bottom line of a company than you know game books that are actually being used and and ran. I mean, ultimately. You're selling books to storytellers because they're the ones who are going to want to run the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, exactly. You know things like uh, you know the large scale organizations like Adventures Leagues, the Mind's Eye Society, you know One World by Night, all the various games that are out there that are less storyteller. Those leagues and groups are more player focused. And so from a company standpoint, it makes more sense to design a book of disciplines and special magic powers or a, a whole book of new classes for 50 players than a book that sells to one storyteller. Mm -hmm. And not to say we don't have those toys mm -hmm. in there for the players. We've got two, well two original playable species and one of which there's like four variations within that that species so and then three rick four 
Uh, we, had original like, we had six. We had, we had like six, six subclasses. Sorry. Uh, we got a, we got so a much, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. But those are, you know, tied to the setting and, you know, there for elements. But I mean, you know, Pat, even if we're honest about it, you pick up that book, you have your player options. I mean, it's like, oh, God, it reminds me of the old school, uh, uh, old old school Vampire the Masquerade books, right? You would pick up this new supplement that told you about like this Clan Giovanni or like these other things, and yeah, there were some player options, but the rest of it was this really badass setting lore and like plot ideas, you know. And it's so it's a book that is useful for your entire play group, and it's definitely not just the here's the book of magic powers and disciplines. Yeah, and. Speaking of that, when it came to when it came to the subclasses that you put in that you put in for the red op for some for something like the red opera, um, and was that was that something that you that that came that came up midway through development, i.e. you i.e. having to this idea that instead that it had to have some new op new options for warlocks, for instance. Um, not really, actually, uh, in the truth is, is for this one, we had finished an entire story and the full campaign. And that was seen as a, Hey, we're going to Kickstarter and we're going to start partnering up with other contributing writers. Um, and we always knew that that would be a good spot to have outside influence and help on. And it was really awesome because we got to work with some really great people out there and literally just yeet them a manuscript and like be like, okay, create this, uh, go forth and read this book and, you know, think of like what class of warlocks you would like to see. And Pat was like, he, he blew up my phone for about a month straight about these evermore warlocks huh. that he put he was like i got this idea about time and warlocks blah 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 it was like non-stop like texting about like pat's dream for this class and i would like wake up to like three or four texts every morning about the evermores and i'm just like okay all right yeah pat we'll do something with subclasses I mean, at some point who's not excited time ba time you know warlocks yeah. with time powers come right. on and um so what we it's finally fucking rad. Am I allowed we, to swear? Did we swear? I don't know. Yeah, you're allowed to swear in the temple. Fuck yeah. yeah. When when we finally hit the stretch goal that allowed us to put in the player classes, like I think that stretch goal got hit, and I think like the next day Pat already had the draft for the Evermores in my fucking inbox. Like it was like he was that excited about his Evermores. And um the, Did that uh, and then and my 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 bears, my polar bear people. Your polar bears, yeah. Uh, mine was the uh, the mirror walkers. I uh, I, I always liked the mirror walkers, and the, uh, like that. They were, that was my favorite subclass, plane shifting warlocks. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so to that point, um, no, they weren't uh, early on in development. We just knew that we had the space for them, and that was the perfect spot for a collaboration. You know, like uh, same with the food chapter, right? We have a whole chapter on food. That's a great spot to work with other people to be like, give us recipes. Mm -hmm. And that is that is something that I appreciate because a lot of because a lot I think a lot of people underestimate uh, recipes in a given region. Yeah, and depending on where they are in say the states, they really shouldn't because. Lord knows I've had to I've had to um play mediator in one of in one of those barbecue debates about whether um Kansas City or Texas makes better barbecue. <laughs> Why can't we just all like all barbecue? I like all barbecue. I don't like that. You can have your preferences. But it is a free country good. and you are free to be wrong. No, it's all meat. <laughs> it's all smoked meats covered in sugar sauce. You think, it's I, all you great. think I haven't tried that? oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, i mean there's yeah i don't know all food is good and you can have your preferences but yeah i know people their barbecue is one things certain states get very very defensive about all food is good except british food okay i kid 
you know, the editor of the Red Opera is a very tiny Brit, and she will admit her food sucks. <laughs> Um, I hold these truths to be self-evident that all are cremated equal. <laughs> but what would you, what, just from a just from a writing and from a design perspective, what would you say was the biggest less the biggest um, lesson as a writer that you had learned regarding the development of the Red Opera? Uh, editorial passes with track changes, um, and to expand upon that. Um, it takes about eight, nine drafts before a book gets through and is ready for layout and even, you know, run, run through. Um, and when you have partners and third party entities uh, sticking their hands in manuscripts and things like that, um, controlling document control becomes a larger issue um, than when you're passing something around between a few people who are professionals about what they're doing. And there was some very like tedious last minute rework um, that knowing what I know now will never happen again because I've set up my future processes to accommodate for that. Um, and the other one is if you have poured your life and your creativity into a project you should always make sure you own the rights to your project yeah that was i was gonna i'm gonna jump on that and say well say from uh because i because i had two points i was gonna make two kind of two answers to the question one more of a creative side and one more on a businessy side so just based jump leaving off what rick just said we'll do the business side because it's less fun yeah so so if you're if you're gonna do this and you're gonna do a, if you if you're ambitious enough and you want to go for a large scale project and you're gonna partner with people um everyone has different things they're bringing to the to the table and if your primary or or only value is that you're you know a creator you are an artist you are a writer it's your ideas if your ideas are the prime contribution or the only contribution to the project is your ideas do not give up ownership of those ideas. They are that is your most precious commodity. That is the one thing you should never give away, uh, unless it's for a giant dump truck of money that is guaranteed to show up in your at your home. Hold on to that, okay? Because that is your value. If you give up that, you don't have any chips left. Mm -hmm. You know, because there are people out there that have influence or money or or printing and just you know print or a printing press or distribution connections and there's all these different people that can bring different things if your the thing that you're bringing are are your ideas it's your ideas that are the actual content of the product do not give up ownership of that now for the more fun on the creative side i would say just something to always keep in the back of your mind if you're going to be writing an rpg book or some kind of rpg publication is you just always have to, what because sometimes you can get too clever for your own self and you might think i've thought of every way that the players are going to react to this and it's like keep the one the rule of thumb should always be the, the the rule the rule should always be i will never think of everything the players are going to try every player is going to try here and to just keep that in the back of your mind because <laughs> you will you won't there's nothing more chaotic than a party of D and D players Mm -hmm. you cannot think of it you cannot plan you cannot so keep that in mind when you're writing stuff that there's always going to be there's always going to be a party out there that's going to think of something or do something in the scenario that you never in a million years would have predicted yeah and in a lot of cases that's part that's part of the fun but that fun is a double-edged sword um uh, but what do you guys ha what do you guys have planned down the road? Well, we have many so things much. planned. <laughs> oh Jesus. All right. So, um okay. Uh Do you want me to go? Do, gotta... do I want to go? go like you sure. go first and then I'll 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 fiddle up. Actually, I I'm really enjoying this. I do have to to go in a little bit, but I can um yeah, I can I, you know, you two want to keep it rolling, go for it. But I uh okay so you know both and rick and i talk we both have a, a th each of us has has a third novel 
in our series in the works that we're currently writing. So there's that. We hey, Pat, to what, what's, what's your series called? Oh, I should probably plug that, right? Yes. Um, my, my novel series is called Space Tripping. By it, I use my middle initial for publishing because my name is pretty you know mundane. So Patrick M. Edwards, Space Tripping. There's Space Tripping 1 and Space Tripping 2. Um, but you know, Space Tripping 1 has an audiobook and is paperback in, e, in Kindle. And Space Tripping 2 is available in paperback in Kindle. And audiobook is in production. Um, so check that out. If you go to my website, thepatedwards.com, there's links to all of that. Also, uh, Rick and I have a number of things. We've got we've got stuff that's been written that's going to be on the shelf. For it's fine for a couple. Of, you know, we've got so much stuff in the works, and we plan on doing a lot more work together in the gaming world. And I, uh, one in particular, I know Rick. Uh, I want Rick to, is going to be a contributor on. Is I got kind of a, a project I'm spearheading called the Wayward Shores. It's a series of modules and i'm kind of like building a source book block by block and i'm debuting each piece of it in live streams we don't have a premiere date for that yet but again if you go to the padedwards.com you can get a little look at the art it's fucking gorgeous and do you you know do you want some piratey D D adventures hell yeah you do you can sign up for the mailing list to be notified of when all that is coming out so go to the padedwards.com and check it out all right. And as for me, um, uh, Pat and I are both absolutely going to, at some point in the far future, work with the band again to write the sequel to the Red Opera called The Black Ballad. Um, okay. I didn't know if we could announce that. So, oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, that is that is definitely a thing that we are going to do um, in the future. And um, that one's that one's probably further out, but it's closer now to being in the works than it probably ever has been um you know we uh obviously past got wayward shorts i have the seventh age series and i'm currently working uh my novel series is about uh sarcastic apocalyptic end of the world type stuff but what happens when the illuminati the masons and a bunch of secret societies had magic forever and a group of anarchists in chicago decide to give that magic to everybody in the world nothing could possibly go wrong and so it's this, you know, urban fantasy, you know, we blast magic back out in the world. And I'm actually taking uh, the dread system and I'm having seven nights of horror about what happens in Washington, D.C. when the when our when our uh, government gets access to demonic magic. And it's using the dread game system. Um, I'm probably going to go to Kickstarter with that um, later early next year. Um, and so that's one of the primary things I'm working on outside of, uh, novel number three, Pat and I are partnering with a few different, um, game companies to write, uh, entire really cool worlds, um, and concepts of integrated play. And, you know, I don't think that there's going to be any shortage of content that Pat and I are both dropping either together or separately, probably my biggest announcement that i'm super happy about is that i got approved to write uh cyberpunk short stories in an anthology with william gibson and mike pondsmith mm -hmm. um and i can't wait i'm like i already got my short story written and i'm going to be in a book with some you know new york times bestsellers and the godfathers of cyberpunk and i'm like freaking honored so literary wise we're both really, really busy. It's just weird because writing takes a long time to get out. So a lot of the stuff that Pat and I are even like mentioning or talking about is stuff that's already been written like a year ago. It's just now finally able to be like, okay, it's into the publication process now. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in, with that in mind. I would like to, since I know you, I know one of you is short on time. I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. That thank you for having us. Yep. Yeah, and thank you so much for having us. Anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. 
I get it. Yeah, I'm, that, I can roll with that. that Next time we come, we're gonna have to have Palomas. All right, all three of them. Yeah, That's well, Palomas. Oh. I'll 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 throw I'll throw together a super short like ninety minute one shot where you two play characters on the search for the perfect Paloma ingredients. <laughs> Was that like Ziltoy trying to find the perfect coffee? <laughs> oh, but. And of, co- and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the show to, to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>